here we are, episode number 104, JT. How you doing, sir? I'm great. How are you? Rocking rock and rolling. Well, excited to introduce our, our listeners of Breaking Business Barriers. But first and foremost, this is your host, Brent Duhame, along with my ever-faithful co-pilot, Jared Ty. We've had, we've had some fun, and, and no doubt, again, we're uh, really looking forward to learning more about John, his story. Understand, I think he's a military vet. We definitely want to go there. Uh, peace. Thank you very much for everything you've done and continue to do as a veteran. But certainly. Hey, John, uh, where, where can our listeners find you? Um, are you on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, or are you hanging down low and, and prefer to be unknown? No, we follow Jared Ty's uh, lead and we try to get into that social media pocket and be as present and as prevalent as possible. So uh, for myself, uh, just John Powell on Facebook. You'll see a picture of my family and myself on there. Uh, on Instagram is uh, JD Powell 12. And then uh, on LinkedIn as well. And then, of course, the practice has its own Facebook page and Instagram page for the Powell Agency NTX for North Texas. Uh, so you can find us on there posting more on the, the insurance side of the house. And then for me, more of the, the John Powell mind of side of the house. Yeah, well, cool, man. Well, as, uh, as normal, why don't you tell us a little bit about what you're doing today professionally? We'll get back into a fork of the road and how you got there. But even before we do that, why don't, we, why don't you give us your 60-second uh, your, uh, snapshot? What makes, J, what makes JP really get out of bed every day? And, and where'd you come from? Born or raised? All that stuff. Sure. Oh, boy. That's, that's another episode. Uh, born and raised in Southern California. Uh, was fortunate enough to, to find my way into banking. Uh, you know, had, had some military experience in there as well, kind of corresponding with banking, some of it being National Guard time, some of it being active duty time, deployment to Iraq, uh, tour as a recruiter and a retention NCO, and then back into financial services as well. And you know, the, the banking industry was always really good to me, uh, but there was something that didn't click. And uh, a lot of it was uh, the, the arguments, the not being able to get the deal across the line, going back and forth and, and finally getting an approval. But my wife saw that taking toll on me. So she encouraged me to go in another direction. And so after a couple of segues, uh, kind of ended up here where my passion is, which is insurance. There, there's not a whole lot in life that we control. There's a lot that we influence but there's not a lot that we can control. Why you have it and how it's going to perform at claims time. And through that conversation, we build whatever that is for businesses, homes, automobiles, even to pets. I saw Jared walking his two little furry friends this morning to school, and we even insure those little guys. So there's not a whole lot that we're not able to do here. And that's really where the passion lies, is in being educational, being consultative, and at the end of the day, helping you understand what you're buying and building what you want. Very cool. I did not know that uh, my dogs could be insured. So. Absolutely. You may get some messages from people asking you to tell them more about that. Oh, and we've got stories about it. It's a, that trip to the vet costs even more than a trip for your kids to the ER sometimes because of the specialization of the equipment and the surgery and everything else that goes into animals. So those vet visits, you know, we hear, hey, my, my dog went in and it was a $3,000 visit is a $6,000 visit because they ate a sock they shouldn't have eaten. Wow. You know, it, it, it can be very, very pricey for that one incident. You know, I've heard horror stories. Uh, Brent, uh, the story of how John and I met is pretty interesting. I can't remember which came first, John, <laughs> but we were, we were, you know, we're both in the kind of, you know, real estate and, you know, insurance and banking, those circles here. So we'd see each other at events. And at some point, we're connected. Person and uh, sat down and had lunch. And uh, 
Yeah, uh, John, you know, I've got enjoyed getting to know you, man, and, um, you know, enjoying your story here. So I'd love to hear more about how you got, you know, to where you are now as a entrepreneur, as a business owner, and as a leader. Sure. You know, I, I think uh, it, it was, it was uh, genuinely a long journey. You know, becoming an entrepreneur is a scary thing. And I, I uh, was meeting with a friend of mine this morning and I said, sometimes we're not transparent enough in our entrepreneurship journey. Uh, we, we show all of the fun vacations. We show the, the high points on social media, but we don't always show the, the points of what it took to get there. And I made a joke a couple of weeks ago on Facebook, and I said that one thing I don't have to worry about as a small business owner is osteoporosis because I eat so much calcium through Tums that I know my bones are going to be strong well into old age. And, you know, the, the journey to, to, to ownership and to uh, really taking on the risk, if you will, was I couldn't see another way. And... I go back to, to banking and it, it seemed like every year your goals were increased, but your variable comp plan was decreased. And I, I got to a point where I, I looked at that and I was, I was scared to death of leaving, but my wife and I had a lot of in-depth conversations and I said, there's perceived security, which is a 401k plan and health insurance and 26 pay periods a year. And then there's perceived insecurity, which is you work hard, you take care of others. And at the end of the day, the only people that can fire you are the people that you're taking care of. So as long as you do a great job, they're not going to want to fire you. And so that opened the door into coming here into the, the agency and to really, I, I don't want to say growing it, but for lack of a better term, growing it, uh, going out. Uh, having honest conversations with people, bringing up points that most people don't think of, whether it be as business owners, whether it be as homeowners, uh, whether it be as people on the road. You don't know what you don't know until you know you don't know it. And that's the, the thing that gets me up in the morning, to your point, Brent, is to sharing with people stories. Like we, we had a, a couple come to us a, about a month and a half ago uh, they were rear-ended by somebody that only had $30,000 of insurance. They only had $30,000 of insurance and their two nights in the hospital just for the bed was $60,000. So that other person's probably only going to pay $30,000. They don't really have any uninsured, underinsured motorist coverage because they had state minimum liability as well. So unless something happens through a judgment, they're going to be on the hook for that medical bill. And most people don't realize that. Most people just get into the car and say, I've got a piece of paper in my glove box and I think I'm okay. And it's not to create fear, but it's to create knowledge and understanding and saying, hey, if you're comfortable with that, I'm comfortable with that. But if you're not, there's a better way and we can show you that way. Um, so I think, again, it's just an evolution of going from being a commercial lender to working with small business owners and showing them a way that they could better capitalize and grow their business to going into retirement planning and showing people a way to send their kids to college and live the retirement that they want and that they're working for day in and day out and coming into the insurance world. It, it just seems like a natural spectrum of, Hey, you're working hard for something. Let's help you keep it. Let's make sure that that stays yours. Well, hey, if anyone takes anything away from this, and I'm sure there'll be more than just what I'm about ready to say, but John, we just filed a claim. Uh, we, our little four-legged furball, who's brand new to our household, had to go visit uh, the ER yesterday, and thank goodness she's okay, but I see my daughter already uh, was in the process of filing the claim. So yeah, we are, uh, we are animal insurance uh, carriers for sure. That's great. No, I think it's, it's for the, for the amount that you pay, uh, one claim can take care of that for your lifetime. And then some, uh, we had a claim recently. I showed the client, it was 155 year break even. I said, unless you live for 156 years, I'll never get my money back. You know, it was, it was a really good decision for them to have that endorsement. Well, there's no doubt that you speak about your line of work with passion. How long you been uh, in the, the truly in the insurance world, the entrepreneurial insurance world? 
Sure. Uh, so believe it or not, agency ownership, uh, just since February of this year, I was recruited away from my retirement planning practice about two years ago to go into leadership for a rather large insurance company. I was a, a assistant district manager helping with 55 different agencies here in the North Texas area, uh, working with them on structuring, growing, uh, managing their agencies. Uh, and then before that, in my retirement practice, I did have life insurance and annuities there. So uh, just in the agency ownership world, being the principal agent uh, since February of this year, all told probably about four years. That's cool. So when you were making, you made, you made a couple of career choices in there, supported wonderfully by your, by your bride. Aside from her, were you ever worried about when you made that change, what other others thought, uh, oh, you know, here's John, you know, he was, he was doing the, this business, you know, we're proud to say he was in the military, you know, all, the, all those friends and family, they can, they can say stuff, right? They may not be experts, but they can say stuff. Were you ever worried about what others were thinking? You know, I, I don't think so genuinely. And th there's probably two reasons to that, you know, num number one, uh, I had a I had a dad that was really independent. Uh, he's one of those kind of older generation folks who'd been on his own since the ninth grade. Uh, joined the Navy at sixteen. They figured out he was sixteen. Kicked him out. He had to come back and try again at seventeen. And he was just fiercely independent to the point of you, you have to, I, I told this morning, I, I served in Iraq with a gentleman who was killed in action and he was killed doing his job. And it, it's not a pleasant thought, but he did the right thing and he paid the ultimate price for it, but that didn't deter him from doing the right thing. And so when I've made decisions, I've, I've really tried to make decisions for those around me, where, where can I be the most useful? Where do I have a skill set? Where do I have an ability? Where can I add value? And so when we've made those decisions uh, as a family, as an individual, uh, I think we've done a good enough job of communicating that to friends and family members and even our children as to why we're making these decisions. Uh, when I was a retirement planner, we, we earned this fabulous trip to Walt Disney World. And my kids thought that I was the greatest dad in the universe. You know, we stayed for a whole week and we got front row seats to every show there was. And it was like this mind blowing event uh, where we had uh, people dressed up like the World War II doobie singers at Epcot singing just to our group for dinner. And I mean, just this extraordinary experience. My kids were like, dad, you're the greatest person on earth. And a month later I said, hey guys, I'm going back to corporate. And my kids, how could you do this to us? And I said, you know, I think it's the right thing to do. Dad built a practice for retirement planning here in Plano. I've been approached to help other people help other people. If I can use my knowledge and my experience to help 55 other agencies help all of those people in the community, then I'm duplicating myself to a level that I can't personally do. And I think my kids, even at nine and 10, understood that if you can touch more people and help more people, you ought to. And I, I think that's kept some of that ridicule, some of that doubt, some of that, oh, here goes John again. I think most people embrace it along with me because I, I feel like we do a good job of sharing the vision and the why as we're making those transitions. So John, um, you were a staff sergeant in the army. Um, Going from a uh, role like that where there's just so much structure and then ultimately becoming an entrepreneur to where any and all structure is dependent upon you, uh, what's that like? What's that like having to be the one creating all the structure? I don't think I could have done it without having been a recruiter. I, I think it also would have been very difficult if I was an active duty soldier straight out of high school and not a guardsman, not a reservist. And so I think there's a lot of complexity 
in my background that has made this, for lack of a better term, easy. You know, there, there's nothing easy about being a business owner, but to the level of expectation, to the level of you can't control outcomes, you can control activities. And that helps me sleep at night. That if we're having the right conversations with the right people, we're going to be okay at the end of the day. And recruiting as a, as a National Guard recruiter uh, on active duty in Phoenix, I was outstationed there. That, that helped me deal with unstructured situations. And a lot of that, you can't control what you can't control. You take someone down to, to join the military and they don't pass the physical or they don't pass the exam. And there's a lot of things. So ultimately, the only thing I can hang my hat on is did I talk to enough people about the opportunity to join the Arizona Army National Guard, ways that you can serve your country and what type of benefits you can receive from that? And so transitioning that into agency ownership, there is not a lot that we control here. And I talk to my folks about that on a pretty regular basis. I don't control much, but I influence a lot. And the things that I do control, I have to be extremely disciplined in controlling those things. Um, insurance has always run on this mathematical calculation of 80, 10, and two. If you have 80 attempts, you should connect with 10 people. And out of those 10, you should onboard two units, whether that be like an automobile, an apartment, or whatever the case might be. And, and so we sat down a couple of weeks ago and I said, you know what, it's been 80, 10, and two since uh, the first British ship left its port and it was underwritten for someone financing that voyage, right? It, does it still hold true? And so we did the backwards math and I said, how many new households do you need in order to have the standard of living that you want? And for my team, it's about 10 new households per month each. And I go, great. So let's say that we have a 5% closing ratio. So let's go 10 divided by 0 0.05. What is that? Well, it's 200. Okay, so how many business days do we have in a month? Well, we have about 20. Okay, so that's 10 conversations a day. So if we talk to 10 people a day and we have real constructive conversations, we're going to be okay. Everything's going to find its way to being successful because we're helping people protect what's most important to them. And, and I think that's the structure that the military taught. I think that's the structure that banking taught, but, but absolutely in recruiting. What, what very little you can control, you must. So you can't control outcomes, but you can control activities. I wrote that down, you need to frame that. <laughs> absolutely, I, I, I say all day, uh, you know, you, you have leading indicators and lagging. And lagging is how much money you make and you have absolutely no control over that. The leading is how many people you try to help. You have, almost infinite control over that. And, and you have to, to focus on those leading. <clears throat> That's so applicable. There's just so many things that, you know, we'll try, you know, whether that be a diet or whether that be something with our work and, you know, we quickly give up, um, you know, because we want that instant. Logging, right? right? Jared Ty encouraging me to get active. So I've got my little, my little <clears throat> tripod here. So I need to increase my activities. I need to control my activities at, at putting more content into the world. Hey, that's great, man. And one thing that, uh, you know, another thing that I've complimented you on, you, uh, um, you're really good at staying positive. You know, you're just really good. You have a very good perspective um, on life. Do you feel like serving in the military influenced that at all to where, you know, your perspective is different than, you know, somebody else who might be worried about the small things right now? And then, that's a tough question because, uh, you know, it's just, it's a, it's a badge of courage that we wear that it doesn't matter how bad things get, you can still have a very dark sense of humor about it. Uh, but then at the other end of the spectrum, we talk a lot about PMA and that's positive mental attitude. And uh, I, I do, I does anything better than the negative mind. I'm a big Zig Ziglar fan and, and there's a lot of things that he shares with the world that's applicable to staying positive. And, and it, it's, it's funny you mentioned that because it's genuinely a conscious effort to 
see the positivity in every situation. I had a neighbor here in the, the building where we're at tell me every time I see you, you say it's going great. Why is that? And I said, because I own my own business. If it's not going great, that's on me, isn't it? Tanner in the tempo in the tanner here. And if, it, if I don't believe it's great, then how can my team possibly believe that it's great? And I do think that some of that's the, the military, but I think, you know, to be completely transparent, I've suffered a lot of the same afflictions that people that come home from combat suffer. And I've seen people about that. And, and you know, it was, it was years of, of going through therapy and, and having conversations and, and reframing the situations to finding where I can have some locus of control. And in other areas, I have none. And being able to focus on those certain areas where I can have a positive impact and I can change the outcome, if you will, that I must. And so some of it's military, some of it's uh, by the grace of, of treatment. And, and I think some of it is just if you're going to be your own boss, you better have a good boss. <laughs> your boss, your boss better treat you well because it's the only one you got. So um, the buck stops here. That's awesome, man. Um, what kind of uh, tips would you give someone who you know they may be a you know salesperson or, or you know they could be mortgage, real estate, insurance, like us three or <laughs> any their industry and they want to grow, you know, they want to build a team, perhaps uh, they want to scale their efforts, but they're worried about letting go. You know, they're worried about that control. Maybe they're worried about the expense. Um, you know, you and I have had this conversation before you have a team and you have a very regimented process. And um, a lot of people in, you know, in, in entre who are entrepreneurs specifically don't have that, you know, they kind of shoot from the hip. So any, any advice you give to that person? So, so, so there's a couple of things there. Um, you know, I, I think when it, when it comes to the, to the advice around making an investment into your future, I, I just had someone recently turn down a job offer that I made them to go someplace else. And the someplace else was a job. The opportunity here was to become a owner in their own right down the road. And I, I fall back a lot to Robert Kiyosaki and the cash flow quadrant. And I, I go back to, do you want to trade your time for money or do you want to trade your time for equity? And when you really understand the answer to that, then I think you're really going to become successful because you're going to see every decision that you make is an investment and not an expense. And that's a big hump to get over. That, that's, that, that's, it's scary. It's unknown. It may not work. And, and the honest answer is it may not. You know, it, it, it absolutely may not. But the alternative is to be trading your time for money because now you're, you're self-employed. You're not a business owner. And the only difference between employed and self-employed is you get to say yes or no. Uh, but at the end of the day, your income and your earning is still capped by whomever you're providing your services to. Uh, when you become a business owner, you become scalable. When you become an investor, you make money in your sleep. And so I, I think there's, there's a big kind of nugget of wisdom there in reading that book, uh, The Cash Flow Quadrant. It's um, a, a story I tell of a plastic surgeon in Napa, California, when I was a commercial banker up there. And he was at the Qantas group asking for money because he was going on a mission trip to work with Smile Train to fix the cleft palates for children overseas. And he said, I realize it's ironic for a plastic surgeon in the Napa Valley to come asking a bunch of business people for money. But at the end of the day, I'm no different than your trash man. If my hands aren't moving, I'm not making money. I'm just a highly paid manual laborer. And the light went off and I was like, holy cow. You know, if this guy can be that humble to say, I'm basically a trash man with a doctorate's degree that charges $350 an hour instead of $35 an hour, there's a, there's a lot that I can take from that humility. And, and I, again, I think when you come to that realization, you can't unsee that. When you see that that is the only path to prosperity, that is the only path to achieving what it is that you desire. For you personally, I know it's more time with your wife and your kids. You, when you see that, hey, the only way that I'm going to have more time with my wife and my children 
is to invest into the scalability of buy with tie, then it becomes so clear that there's absolutely no other answer but that. So, so I think embracing that is number one. I think number two is understanding the desire and the objectives of your stakeholders. And so today, one of my agents was very frustrated because there's an auto policy that she wasn't able to bind. And I said, well, I'm frustrated as well, right? If, if you're not making money, I'm not making money. That's how being a business owner works. But, but let's look at it from the insurer. It probably doesn't pose any more risk than another person in the same situation because they're in a very unique situation. But if the insurer did this for everyone, imagine how expensive insurance would be because we'd be taking on that much more risk. So sometimes we have to put ourselves into the shoes of other people that we may not be comfortable being in their shoes or sometimes we may even see ourselves at odds with them. But if we put ourselves on the same side of the table as them and we understand what they're trying to accomplish, we do a better job of accomplishing that task. So I think part of it is understanding your desired outcome, your stakeholders desired outcome, and then embracing a philosophy and investing into yourself and investing into your future. And again, there's, there's going to be ups and downs that we, we did not have a great month this last month. We had someone out with COVID and we struggle like every other small business does when we're down one person. But this month is, is starting out fantastic because we managed our activities and we actually hired another individual in that, that down month. And we have a job offer out to another one in that down month because the only way that we can see our way out of this is through investing in the future. Wow. So, Brent. There are a bunch of nuggets in there, and I jotted some down. I saw you writing, JT, as well. A lot of, lot of really cool nuggets. In fact, you answered some of the questions I was going to, I was going to ask you, John. So that was uh, – you, you're on point, man. Well, that's thank you. that's really you. good. You know, one of the special ones I took away from what you said or what you quoted was, uh, are you willing to trade time for money or time for equity? That's a big one. Sure. You know, being – you know, all three of us have been business owners, and and it, that's a hard, it's a hard thing early on. It can be really hard or maybe it can be really easy. Just to, it depends on the determination and then the support, whether it's family and or friends uh, behind you, you know, giving you that extra nudge, but great uh, stuff, John. Don't get me wrong. I wake up at 3 a.m. sometimes like every other entrepreneur sometimes and think, you know, you know, what, what am I doing here? And, and I sit there and I, I think about it and I go through my checklist of, you know, did we do this? Did we do this? Are we doing the right thing the right way for the right people? And I said, you know, we're, we're, we're doing it. We're controlling what we control. Go back to bed. And uh, again, it's, it's a discipline and it, it takes time. But even, you know, I think folks that I talk to that are 15, 20 years down the road, uh, they still wake up at three in the morning and think, boy, when am I going to feel successful? Yeah, it's the curse of business ownership is it doesn't really matter how long you've been in it or, or how well you're doing financially. It, it's uh, success is fleeting and you have to continue to work at it and evolve and grow and, and continue to add to your tool chest. Uh, John, that's fantastic. Go ahead, JT. I've got a question for you here. Um, there are so many people out there who do, you know, what I do. <laughs> There's so many people who do what you do. Um, what advice would you give someone who says, man, I do X, Y, Z business, but so do 30 other people. I need a way to stand out. I need to a way to make, you know, connection when somebody thinks, you know, insurance, I want them to think my name, what advice would you give that person? So if we're going to say that the positive mind can do anything better than the negative mind, I think a close second to that would be the funny presenter can do anything better than the non-funny presenter. The, the more you can, you can inject humor into your conversations, the more memorable you are and the more it puts people at ease. Because let's be honest, insurance is probably the least sexy topic that we can think of people except for maybe getting dental work done and so being able to inject some humor into that and, and being memorable goes a long way but i think a term i've used for years is how do you differentiate your c yourself in a sea of sameness 
And there is, especially in North Texas, you're absolutely correct. I went to a networking event one time and some guy was muttering in the corner. It feels like it's advisor appreciation day at these things still advisor appreciation day i heard you guys were hosting a big lunch for us and i wanted to come out and participate in that now if you don't have a great relationship with your current retirement planner give me a call i'd love to hear about that and, and so taking the edge off of it by calling it what it is and addressing it immediately hey i know that you're going to run into a million realtors today but there's only one jared time why is that important because I'm more connected in McKinney than the next guy is. And I'm going to do my best to get you plugged into this community and get you where you want your family to be. And that's why you're moving here in the first place. And, and we do that with insurance. We, we want to have a different conversation. When we talk to folks about insurance, the one comment that I continue to hear when I'm auditing my, my folks' calls is I've never heard someone talk about insurance this way before. And that's what we want. And it's okay to push back. And it's okay to say, well, wait a minute. I understand why you think that. Some lizard on the television told you that. But last time I checked, the lizard doesn't have a massive checkbook to pay anything over stated limits. By law, an insurance company cannot pay over stated limits. So do you have the right limits? Do you want me to pay for all of it, some of it, or none of it? It because those are my only three options. Conversation. I, I teach my folks, hey, if you're calling an internet lead and they say, I'm not interested, I say, great, I'm not selling anything. And they're like, well, you know, why'd you call? Said, well, why'd you call? You know, you put your information online and you asked for me to get a hold of you. How can I help? And they go, well, I'm good. And I go, well, here's what I found. Most happy couples don't go on match.com. And you went on to the match.com of insurance. So something's, something's wrong, right? Uh, you got me on the line. This is what I do for a living. Let me help you, right? Because whatever it is that got you to go online and spend 20 minutes putting in your firstborn social security number and everything else, it's not going to go away, yeah. right? It's, it's still going to be there. It, it's not going to take long. I have most of your information here, but help me help you. What is it that has you out shopping for insurance today? And that's different than the most people are like, hey, Jared, giving you a call. It looks like you're shopping for insurance. Just need to verify your driver's license number. Is this it? Great. I'm going to get you a quote out an email in five minutes. How do I know if that's a good quote or not? I don't know. I don't know what you're looking for. I don't know why you're shopping. So be different. Yeah. I love that approach of breaking the ice, uh, making it human, you know, to have that interaction that, hey, I, I'm going to, you know, have a good two minute talk with you if nothing else, whether you buy or not, you know. Um, and something that you've touched on before that you, you know, told me about is just your follow-up routine. You know, we mentioned there's, you know, so many people in, you know, various industries. Uh, but what I found is that very few of them, you know, going back to your quote about you can control your, you can't control your outcome, but you control your activities. Um, you know, if you follow up with someone repeatedly, um, you know, once you reach a certain point, you may be the last one standing you know, somebody else might have given up because that's that's the part of the job that's not fun. It's not fun to call people, you know, when you're not really sure how they're going to react. Not fun, but profitable. Yeah, yeah. And there's a quote I heard from someone who goes, the, and I, I wish I could remember who to attribute it to, although I'm sure they stole it from somebody else as well. But, you know, it's it's the, the I think the way that they put it is the money is in the follow-up. Mm -hmm. and, and that is absolutely true. You know, anyone can touch it once, but continuously reaching out to meet that need, that does tend to differentiate the, protect, the professionals from the transactionals. And I think that same role of maintaining those activities, even if you're not seeing instant results, I think that carries over to uh, marketing and, um, you know, social media marketing. You're really good at staying in front of people on there. And, you know, I, I talk to other people and they say, well, you know, I tried, you know, putting content out. I wasn't really getting any business from it. So I stopped. And, um, you know, I, I studied marketing in college. You know, a lot of marketing is hard to measure. You know, you're getting your name out there. You're making an impact. People may not be commenting. I mean, I had a, a, a client call me that I honestly forgot we were even connected on social media. And she was, when we met, she was referencing all of these, you know, posts and I'm sitting here thinking, you know, you never commented or liked it. <laughs> and, 
but that just goes back to, you know, doing those activities. Um, again, you can't control the results, you can control the activities. And, um, you know, it's a very universal principle there. So I'm definitely going to hang up that, that quote somewhere. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, right on, John. It's been, it's been a pleasure to hear your story. Lots of really good nuggets in there. And whether it's in our, in the careers and professions that we're all three in, they all overlap somehow or another, especially with the entrepreneur, because you've got to be the service person, the salesperson, maybe the genius behind the technology, whatever it is, or know where to find those, those folks that, that can do that for you. But it's been a pleasure to hear your story. I was excited to meet you. We've not met. And, and especially in our kind of a close, close worked industries, you know, but now I can say what we have and, and hopefully we can uh, go have a cup of coffee or some sort of beverage uh, sometime here sooner rather than later, because here we are this time of year, this year has flown, you know, last, yeah, last year nice. was a whole nother story. Not sure, you know, that's, uh, um, we're still going through those things with the, the virus and all those things. But, man, it's a pleasure to hear, hear you talk, hear your path, salute to your service and, and what have you. So on behalf of my partner, Jared Ty, John, again, thanks for being uh, episode number 104, Breaking Business Barriers. It's been a pleasure, my friend. Talk soon onward, and it's definitely upward.